Yeah, I was gonna say we, we covered it a bit, but the two most common I'd say by far are uh, unpatched resources, uh, just because uh, you know that's essentially just kind of like leaving your key under the mat, right? Like there's uh, you know a, a popular software will have a known issue, uh, you know there'll be an exploit that's put out in the in the wild, and if you don't pat the thing is. A lot of com- a lot of companies, a lot of organizations, they just don't have a good patching strategy, right? They they're they're not aware of it, or they are, but they don't do a good job. So that's just like it's easy money, right? Like just how you can always fish somebody, like you're you're always gonna be able to fish an organization no matter what. You can always get in through that as well. So I'd say that's really common. Um, another one is just like we were saying before of the uh, improper access. Um, you know, it's super easy for people to just flip things uh, to be public or, you know, maybe they're maybe they have a server, an EC2 in a in a subnet that they think is private. But then let's say they're, you know, maybe they're not familiar with what they're doing and they attach an IGW to the subnet. Well, all of a sudden now it's private or now what was a private subnet is now public subnet. Right. So um, I, I'd say that's pretty common. Uh, um I just circle back to the metadata because I've actually been asked that metadata question as well. So yeah, I would definitely recommend if you're doing any uh, kind of interview, it's, it'd be good to be familiar with that because really that's a way to kind of just get, it's, it's almost like a backdoor into the environment to be able to query that service. Cause you just get so much information um, that, that, that can kind of lead to a uh, compromise as well. Right. Uh, if you're able to query like EC2 metadata service or what have you. Um, as far as how the compromises happen, really, really typical, common, um, like what did the criminals actually do, right? Uh, would be uh, like ransomware or crypto mining. So, um, you know, the the big breaches, the one where like the really good state actors and they're and they're just trying to get data or whatever. Really, they're they're good enough that almost they that they they won't be caught. But what's more common is that you'll just have these kind of lower to mid tier criminals, which will just be kind of just running, you know, rampant roughshod over, over, uh, resources. Um, and they're, they're just wanting to get money, right? So the quickest ways they can get money ransomware because it encrypts and they can, you know, they, they can request Bitcoin or whatever, Monero, whatever your cryptocurrency of choice. Um, but th- those are, I'd say are, are common like use cases of what they're going to do. Uh, and those actually aren't really terrible outcomes. Um, because, they're not really concerned with the data, right? Like, let's say you have a sensitive uh, server that has, like, let's say, customer credit card data. A lot of the times, they're not even concerned with like what's on the box. They're just wanting to just steal a resource. So, um, it, it's it's important to to like know what their objective is, and you can not, you can kind of know as a result of like what um, you know, like what what do they do once they gained access to the box. Um, and that, that kind of leads into your fifth one. What are the most helpful logs? Uh, so every single time I've ever had an AWS, um, uh, let's say compromise cloud trail, you're always going to look at, right? Especially if it's anything involved with the user compromise, because you're going to be wanting to check like what resources were created, what resources were deleted, what users are created, right? So cloud trail, any, any kind of log uh, that, is recording the API activity. Um, NetFlow is going to be probably your your second most important, or maybe first most. Uh, with with AWS, that's VPC flow logs. Um, so that's just going to be telling you, like, you know, was there uh, like a de- like you might have to answer, was there exfiltration of this sensitive data off this off this box? Mm-hmm. And using NetFlow, using VPC flow logs, you could say, oh yeah, I I was able to see that the attacker who logged in from such and such IP, then was sending the information back and you could track like they sent 50 megabytes or five gigabytes or whatever, right? So those logs are very important. The third one I would say, um, it's gonna be whatever resource that was actually dealt dealt with the compromise. So like, let's say it was S3, it's gonna be like the detailed um, object level logging. Like if it's EC2, then it's gonna be whatever logs that you Mm -hmm. have that are on board in like, let's say var slash logs if it's a Linux instance. Mm. Um, so yeah, and to kind of get to your second part, where are cloud logs in general lacking? 
exactly. That's a great question because they're lacking in the part where, uh, like, like it, basically you're going to have your, your kind of standard log set up like a cloud trail, but that's, that's all going to be a uh, service level. Your, your actual resource level logs is something that you need to set up as well. Um, or in addition to, let's say, so that's, um, that's something that would, you'd, you'd want to call out, uh, especially in an interview to say like, uh, well, you know, if an EC2 instance is compromised, I could go and look on the box, but you know, are you sending those logs out to a central location? Are you actually, do you have a sensor or something installed, um, to pull those logs? Uh, you know what I mean? Um, what visibility is commonly lacking during cloud forensics? No, Daniel, did you have any thoughts on that last part? Yeah, so in terms of kind of three log sources, right? When you, when you approach an incident, your, your first task is identifying like what has happened uh, and then in, in conjunction to that, what things were affected by it. And so to Troy's point, like CloudTrail or, or like the actual platform logs can be really, really good. Um, and pretty much everybody does a decent job of enabling those things. Very, very few orgs like really fail uh, at that, where you'll really see people commonly not have the logs is NetFlow. And the reason is because there's not a ton of value outside of security, right? Like application teams aren't really using them to troubleshoot much um, and different things like that. And there's also just a ton of volume and a ton of noise. And so usually it's like, a cost um, concern for an org. And that's kind of crippling because when you're faced with the task of, for example, identifying if there was lateral movement as uh, part of an incident or an attack, or simply identifying where traffic is going after something is being executed on a box, right? Commonly uh, in an attack, some, the first thing somebody's gonna do is set up command and control. Um, and then try to use that initial point to pivot or do lateral movement. Um, and without NetFlow logs, it can be really difficult to identify if that has happened already or is still in progress, or if it's already happened somewhere else and you're actually only detecting the actual lateral movement. So it's very, very um, kind of important in your incident response to have that NetFlow. Um, and to uh, kind of pivot off that, sometimes firewall logs or or WAF logs specifically um, can kind of help provide that same kind of information. So there's some overlap there. Uh, and then I think also to Troy's point, the next big piece that you know very, very few orgs really do well is application logging, right? Understanding what's happening at that application layer. And so that might be, the application might be S3 or storage service, or it could be an actual application that the group is, you know, has authored themselves and is providing service to their customers. And so understanding what that application is doing um, is pretty important. It kind of just depends on um, the nature of the attack, right? For vulnerability-based stuff, you're usually exploiting like the underlying host versus with a lot of your cross-site scripting or really uh, kind of application-focused attacks, you're, you're looking at something coming in through the API, manipulating different things that the application can do and accessing like the database or or different things that the application is functioning at. And without application logs, you're not gonna know um, what's happening, right? Your, your next bet, like I was in an incident a while back where those logs were present. We didn't have NetFlow, we didn't have application logs. And so when the question was presented, like, you know, could they have gotten to our data? We literally had to pull like a massive history um, of database logs and then try to baseline the database activity and like the requests against the database over a long period of time, and then just hope that the attacker would have done something out of the ordinary that we could detect just by seeing like, did we get a spike in requests or did we see, you know, like a dump table kind of thing. Um, so if, if the attacker happened to do low and slow, or if, if they were doing anything like that appeared to be normal, we would have no real way of finding it. And so in that org, it was it was kind of troublesome for us to really define the scope and impact of that incident because we knew we're really just making kind of a best guess. Um, and so those are some kind of examples of, of the different logs that are really important. I think, you know, if you had to pick three, you probably won't see a question like that. You'll probably see questions more like, you know, if this logging doesn't exist, 
what would you do uh, to like figure things out or, you know, what's, what's your best effort um, kind of response look like. And so really just understanding how to use what you have for each log source is, is probably your best bet to prep for that kind of interview.